And I'm really happy to introduce our moderator for this panel, Heba Amin. Uh, Heba is an Egyptian visual artist, researcher and lecturer. She is currently teaching at the Bard College in Berlin and she's also a doctorate fellow at the Freie Universität. Uh, she is the co-founder of the Black Athena Collective <laughs> and uh, also the curator of visual art for the Mizna Journal and curator for the biennial residency program Default with Random Association in Italy. Um, Heba Min is also one of the artists behind the subversive graffiti action on the set of the television series Homeland, uh, which received worldwide media attention. And I really want deeply to thank Heba because uh, she actually got also the notice to moderate this panel two days ago because unfortunately Donatella Della Ratta could not come. So, I mean, I'm really proud that you accepted this invitation because I think you are a really great moderator and so we are honored to have you with us. And uh, we are also honored to have these uh, special speakers that uh, I'm not going to introduce personally because this will be your duty. Uh, but uh, I want to thank them deeply also to be here with us this night and for the work that they do that is really important and relevant. Thank you. Is this, can you hear me? Great. So yesterday, during Friday prayers, the Al Rauda Mosque in the small town of Bir al Ayabid in Sinai province was targeted in what is deemed as the town's deadliest attack in recent memory. The latest counts of deaths that I just checked um, is 305 people and rising, with over, over 100 injured. No one has technically claimed the massacre, but it has been reported that um, Egyptian officials indicated that the attackers were carrying the flag of the Islamic State group. Dr. H.A. Hellyer and Middle East scholar relayed to the BBC this morning Quote, what is particular about this attack is that this is not only the first on such a scale, but it was also carried out with such a lack of interest in local dynamics. Until now, radical groups have been trying to recruit in Egypt from among local Egyptians. It is very difficult to see that will be remotely possible following this attack, irrespective of local grievances vis-a-vis -vis the state. If anything, this will only intensify local opposition to any group that claims the slightest bit of sympathy for attacks of this nature, end quote. However, as one of our speakers, Abdel Aziz Al-Hamza, points out in an interview last month with The New Yorker, quote, even now we have to be aware that ISIS will remain a time bomb. Um, they were able to spread their ideology to so many young people in Syria, the region, and throughout the world. It is so important to fight against the ideology and prevent the new generation being radicalized. And RBSS, Raqqa, is being sla slaughtered silently, has to go on exposing these violations and help prevent the explosion of an ideological time bomb." End quote. So our upcoming keynote, aptly titled Fractured Lands, is about the particular geographies that are confronting the Islamic State. Both of our speakers, in different ways and through various platforms, have been integral in relaying the specifics of what is going on by making visible the details of a complex and complicated narrative, and one that most of us seem to have lost complete track of, and yet I believe we no longer can extract ourselves from the responsibilities of such narratives. Our first speaker is Abdel Aziz Al Hamza. He is award winning Syrian journalist, human rights defender, and activist living in Germany. He's the founder and spokesperson of Raqqa is Being Slaughtered Silently, which is a nonpartisan independent organization that exposes the atrocities committed by the Bashar al Assad regime, ISIS, and other groups in Syria. Al Hamza started non volatile protests and demonstrations against the Syrian regime in 2011 and was arrested by the regime three times in 2012. ISIS interrogated him more than one time about his activism. After ISIS took control of his hometown, uh, uh, Raqqa, in January 2014, he escaped to Turkey and started RBSS with his friends to show the reality of life in Raqqa and ISIS. 
In 2015, Al Hamza received the International Press Freedom Award by the Committee to Protect Journalists and was named a Global Thinkers by Foreign Policy. In 2016, he was awarded the Ishia International Journalism Award, the Civil Courage Prize, and other awards on behalf of RBSS. And lastly, the film City of Ghosts, which, as I just heard, um, premiered in Berlin on Thursday, directed by Matthew Heinemann, follows the journey of Raqqa as being slaughtered silently. Our second speaker is Aaron Y. Zellin. Aaron is the Richard Burrow Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, where his research focuses on Sunni Arab jihadi groups in North Africa and Syria, as well as the trend of foreign fighting and online jihadism. He is also a PhD candidate at King's College of London, where his dissertation is on the history of the Tunisian jihadi movement. Zelen is the founder of the widely acclaimed and cited website jihadology.net, and its podcast, Jihad Pod. He is also the author of the New America Foundation's January 2013 study titled, The State of the Global Jihad Online, and another study named The War Between ISIS and Al-Qaeda for Supremacy of the Global Jihadist Movement, and another one called The Islamic State's Territorial Methodology, um, and many additional um, publications. So please help me in welcoming our two guests for this keynote on Fractured Lands. So, hello everybody and thank you for coming. I know it's too late and it's been a long day. So, and I always feel hard to speak at the end because like just listening to the previous panelists was like interesting and I thought, I think they spoke about most of the things that I want to speak about. So, I'm sorry if you will feel in some point that I'm repeating something that you heard last two day, today and yesterday. I just before you start, I just want to mention, I almost forgot, I would like to, um, a disclaimer, um, because we will be showing a, a graphic video um, of an execution, and so I just wanted to warn you beforehand um, that he will inform you when that will happen, um, so you're forewarned. Yeah, I will inform you, and like, if you're like sensitive, you can't close your eyes, I'm sorry. So. The first thing that I will start with, why, what I'm doing here. So, like you've seen like experts, people. So I'm not a journalist really. I studied biochemistry. So basically I should deal with oxygen, carbon, not sitting here speaking with you. So, jump, so I'm from Syria, from Raqqa. And here's like a map of Syria because in one of the conference I was speaking about Syria for one hour and like I got one question, is Syria in Africa? But no, it's not in Africa, in the Middle East. And I tried to explain, we have like borders with Turkey, blah, blah, and that person didn't know. I told him like, do you know Israel? He said yes. We said, oh, we're like almost in the same area. So anyway, I wanted just to highlight that thing. So that's me. So I supposed to play soccer, not sitting here with you. And then, okay, speaking about Raqqa, my city. So I grew up in that city and uh, you can see it here in the map, like the red circle. So it was even not mentioned in the weather news for several reasons. So like the first time as how the Assad visited Syria, they tried to assassinate him and the city started to be forgotten. So even some people in Syria, they don't know where is it before the revolution and suddenly we turned to be famous in a bad way, having ISIS. So jumping to the next slide, speaking like the title of the panel is speaking about converting ISIS or like extremism or whatever. But I want to start to speak about Syria and how all that things started. It started in March in 2011 as peaceful protests. So people hit the street demonstrating, asking for freedom. They didn't ask for anything else. But the way how the Syrian regime acted to them by killing or shooting civilians, that turned the things to be more complicated. And then speaking about the media or like the coverage of the media, which was like an important part. So for me, like after like there were like thousands of demonstrations in the city, like in my city in Syria and like all over the country, I went back home and I turned the TV and like I was waiting to see like videos of the demonstrations. And here like a screenshot of the local TV and they were like discussing what will happen to the earth if the sun would disappear. 
So, and then in this point, something called citizen journalism, born in Syria. So it was like the first moment, like speaking about Syria, which had a really strong intelligence service. So where we used to say like many slogans that walls have ears, which mean that you might end up with your brother being a spy, your father and your mother. And then if we, like when I growing up as a kid, hearing like someone was arrested for political reasons, we used to say, ah, uh, they, they will send him after the sun, which means like we'll not see him anymore. Or like we could say also, he's not gonna see the sun anymore, which means that he will remain men in jail, either killed or like being jailed forever. So then the important question should we ask ourselves all the time, where did ISIS come from? So the thing, ISIS is not a new thing. So it's not a new group because like ISIS more or less is an ideology. And it started with Taliban, turned to Al Qaeda and ended up with ISIS, which is basically a united between Islamic State in Iraq in 2006 and Nusra Front, which is Al-Qaeda part in Syria. So they gathered together and they established Islamic State and they, like, they announced the Khilafat in Raqqa in April 2014. So many people, they thought they were like a new group that like just appeared from nowhere. But no, they were like exist for like, for like years, but the problem that the international community it like declared that they won like against terrorism or extremism in several places like Afghanistan, Pakistan, or wherever. But the problem they were like just defeating the arms, not the ideology. And this ideology turned to be ISIS. Like everyone was shocked with of the name of Osama bin Laden, Al Qaeda. Right now they started to be forgotten. And like I have like many friends and especially Syrians, they say like, okay, Nusra or Al Qaeda turned to be kind of a civil society organization comparing with ISIS. So in 2013, Raqqa was liberated or Assad forces were defeated from the city and it was the first city that ran out of the government control. And in that period, it was like for me the best period we were able like to speak about many things, we were able like to express whatever things we want to say. There were like many journalists who came to the city in four, like in, like in one month, like more than 40 civil society organizations started to be like to care like about education, about everything. And then we found out like provincial and local council that were running the city. So local themselves, they run the city. Activists themselves run the city, not the armed group or like no, no one else. So we're, as a Syrians, we gained this experience how to run cities because I, like if you can imagine that you will close your eyes and wake up tomorrow and there is no government, there is no police, there is no more miracle anymore, so what you will do? So then like all the activities, the demonstration kept to happen in Raqqa, I'm sorry using too many slides. So, but that was like we pushed all people like to be part of the community, be part like of the new life. And we didn't know that like a strangers who called ISIS will come to our city. So later on ISIS arrived to the city and there were like two cars, they drove to the countryside, then they announced the Khilafat and then they didn't start to change things directly. So they started step by step. I believe the next video is the execution video, wait, yeah. If you if you have like any problems, you can close your eyes. I think I skip it. Yeah. So that was the first execution ever in Raqqa City, and uh, be and it was like my first time to see like a live execution. So. Even like all Raqqa people, it was like the first time. They brought three masked people and they announced that there are like a Syrian regime spies. And like they didn't announce their names, even like ISIS fighters, they are all masked. So we had no idea. And here we felt that there is something strange. And the way how people like reacted to that, they didn't stay home. So the media focused how brutal ISIS are, but they didn't like notice or like spoke about the role of the community or like the civil society organizations. So that like after like a couple of days, 
Ah, oh, sorry. Wait. No. So like it was like a demonstration that they were like saying rock hurra hurra barra which means rock as a free free and ISIS should get out. So people they went to the street, they started to demonstrate they didn't accept the idea of ISIS because it's something like strange of our community or our culture. And then, like, for me, I was focusing more about education and that my university where I graduated from doesn't look fancy, but I love it. Anyway, like, one, like in some point, because I was focusing on education, I was sleeping at the university. So the main thing that we were able to run universities, to run schools, to run everything. So we had education back to the city. We got a paper signed from all the armed groups that is not allowed to any armed person to enter like universities and school. And for kind of protection, I was sleeping there at the university. At one of the nights, uh, masked man with a Saudi accent, they looked like those. They drove to the university and they started, and like they drove with their cars and guns. I went out, I told them like, please step out, you can't come with your like guns and like your like, like bomb belt or whatever. And then they went out, like one of them refused to put his like fancy clock gun and like has built out and like he was speaking in a Saudi accent and I said like I'm not gonna agree with him I don't want to be dying so we get inside and he started to speak many people they think that ISIS fighters are stupid but they have like really smart people so this person who's called Abu Muhammad al-Jazrawi he's like the smartest person that I ever met so he started to speak and then like he was answering questions and agri things not from Islamic background or religious background from like philosophy from science from whatever and like when we had like any question to ask we were saying like one or two three words and I was saying okay your question is one two three four and the answer blah blah we were like five almost graduated students, like university students. And like for me, I'm like, I smoke too much. And I told him, I'm, I'm running to the toilet. I will be right back. I went to the toilet. I smoked half of the cigarette. When I was coming back, it was like almost 10 meters. And he said, ah, how was your cigarette, Sheikh? So he knew that I was smoking, even if he never seen me smoking before. So at the end, he was able to recruit three of us, we were like five. So they had people who had like several ways to convince you. So they notice what like your weaknesses, what, th what things that you're interested in, and they agree with you. So they don't agree with you up like to a religious background. So here in January 2014, ISIS took over the city, and then they had this military show with tanks or whatever. So it might be like a bit longer, but here they were like celebrating. And in that point, I had just to flee the city because uh, they came to my house to arrest me because I was covering what's going on in the city. Anyway, I was lucky enough to flee the city. And when I went to Turkey, I kept in touch with the friends, the relative colleagues about what's going on in Raqqa. And like we started to hear all this horrible rules that they started to establish and like public execution as you see in the photo and many other things. And then back that time, like either the international community or the international media had, they haven't had, like they didn't hear about what's going on in Raqqa or like about ISIS or whatever. So we decided to, yeah, here's a good question, why Raqqa? So many people, they ask, okay, why Raqqa? Why not Homs or like Mosul or whatever? Why they declared Raqqa as a capital? For several reasons, I will run away. So Raqqa is so rich with gas. We have like gas everywhere. We have oil. So when Raqqa, like when Assas forces were defeated, people, they were like walking 10 meters in front of their houses, digging 20 meters, they got oil. So we were like so rich city. We have like the main three dams in Syria that provide 70% of electricity and water. We have agriculture. So we were like a rich city. We have antiques, we have many things. 
So ISIS focused more on the children because it was so easy to recruit and they forced, the, they didn't force people like to join them, but they made the conditions so hard for the people to live in. So prices started to get expensive day after day. People, they started to lose their jobs. There were like technically no jobs. And that was like a way to convince people to join them. I'm gonna focus more about children because children who had like these conditions, their families were not pro able to provide them like let's say like the basic thing like a sweets or whatever at the same time children were playing in the street and ISIS came with tents and telling them like making games for them one plus one and whoever answered they gave them like mobile phones money in dollars sweets many things their families were not able to provide and for any kid or children who did who or she decided to join, they didn't ask for a permission or approval from the family. And then they sent those children to this arresting camps or like training camp, sorry, and we were able just to smuggle these videos out of these camps. And then, yeah, so they were teaching them how to use like weapons, guns, how to carry, whatever. And then they used them in the bottles to carry weapons, guns, medicine, and send them to bomb some, themselves whenever like to let the leader escape in like in bad conditions. So I wanna speak more about the media of ISIS. So ISIS were able to recruit like thousands of fighters from more than 84 countries. And that was through the media, through the social media. And we've done a documentary recently, as Hiba mentioned, it's called City of Ghosts. And I wanted to share this, like, not short clip with you. Like, my colleague is explaining the way of ISIS media because he's focusing more about that thing. So it's in Arabic, but it has, like, English subtitle. تنظيم أول ما بلش بمدينة الرقعة كان يوزع أصداراته بسيديات داخل المدينة كان فيديوهات فاشلة جدا 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 لحد أنه كنا نفكر بموبايلات عم يصوروها حاول التنظيم هو التنظيم بشكل كامل بيشتغل على الإعلام أكثر من الإسلاح فأي فيديو صار ينتجه بعد سيطرت على مدينة الرقعة هو فيديو احترافي لجذب المناصرين له كان توم ولكن يا احبتي في الله رغم ذلك كله ما زالت الدولة بحاجة ماسة الى اولئك الرجال الذين يملكون القدرة الاعلامية في ايصال المعلومات الحقيقية الى الناس زاراتها الضخمة تستخدم تأثيرات هوليودية تنافس الأفلام الكبيرة بميزانيات عالية أيا كان الفيديو تقريبا الإفكتات هي نفسها أو الاحترافية هي نفس الاحترافية لجذب المناصرين له مثل لعبة السيارات المعروفة جي تي اي او على المدينة ليش تتلعبها على الكمبيوتر او على الانترنت بالوقت اللي انت تقدر تلعبها على الواقع هاي الالة الاعلامية اللي تستخدمها داعش مشان تجنيد خلافتهم المزعومة بس داعش ما تمثل الاسلام اللي انا اعرفه استغلهم الاسلام لمصلحتهم الشخصية واستخدموا الاعلام لهالغرض Okay, so like I think like my colleague explained like some points how people started to join ISIS and there is a document was published first by Ayman Tamimi who's here and it's showing like how much money ISIS spent on the media every like in one month in Derizor and it's here it's like one hundred fifty five thousand dollars so it's like only in Derizor in one month that what they spent in the media so they knew that media is like a main like 
mean to you to recruit people and they were like success in it like the video that you just watch like if you will bring someone who was like not here the last 10 years and will tell him like just watch this video he will tell you oh Hollywood like developed in a such great way so this like selects video turned to be like something people start to ask themselves how they started to do that things. They started to promote themselves that they are like the representatives of Islam, Muslim Sunni, and they came just to protect Muslim and all that things. And it was like also a way to recruit people. And here's another question. Why people from all over the world joined ISIS? So it's not only because they did believe in the ideology of ISIS. So I will give like short examples. Like since I'm living here in Germany and so-called all the time, I met like a family of a daughter, 16 years old daughter, that went and joined ISIS and I noticed that the daughter and the family they are not Muslim they are Christians and they had nothing to do with Islam nothing to do with ISIS nothing to do with anything and they thought that they were like a way far away from ISIS and suddenly the daughter went and joined ISIS and when I asked about how did that happen they said like she was in touch with her like uh, with her friend in the school and she convinced her to come and here like I'm it's like also a fault of the governments here because this daughter she traveled alone from Germany to Turkey without any approval without anything and they let her in so one of the reasons that okay many people or families they thought that they're like way far away from ISIS speaking about Dizzy Dog or Abu Talha Al-Almani who's like a robber and he was like wearing t-shirt against Islam and he was like arrested several times for committing crimes and he suddenly joined ISIS and he turned like to be extremist and then he was treated in a bad way he was like ignored his community and when he went and joined ISIS he turned like to be a celebrity or like a famous person and all what the me the German media were doing recently ah uh, Abu Talha took a selfie that was like the front bridge there is nothing else he just took a selfie you know so he started he turned to be a famous person so Joining ISIS sometimes might turn you to be a famous person. Others, they join for money, for sex, for cars, for like several reasons. And others just to gain power. So other people, they had like issues when they were a kid. They were like ignored, they were like, to, like they were like punished by their families, their friends, their colleagues. And they found like joining ISIS a way to gain power and to revenge. So other reasons, later on my colleagues and I, we decided to start Rock as Being Slaughtered or Silently or RBSS to show all that things, to show the reality of what's going on in Rock. So this is our logo. So, and here we decided just to show the other face of what's going on in the city. So here is like a, f a video. There are like people waiting in line to get some food. So we filmed that video in Rock. And then we decided just to publish these videos and do this such of these campaigns, which is called like the other side. Like here to the right, you'll find like people waiting in a queue to get some food while ISIS fighters are drinking Pepsi and eating like fancy food in fancy restaurants. So it was like a way to let the people know what's really going on because that time, like googling anything about ISIS, you'll find like all the propaganda. If you'll google how to join ISIS, Google will help you to do like to be there in 10 seconds. So later on, we decided that okay, it will not will not be like only a media organization that's reporting in news because we felt it's so important to show that there is a resistance movement in the city. So I think it's not like really. So here we started to do graffiti campaign to tag walls like an ISIS strongholds down, down with ISIS so and like that was like driving ISIS crazy and they were like blocking all the neighborhood like doing all the checks and then like also the poster campaigns just to spread poster in the, in the city and like with the posters we just reminded the people that okay freedom is saying like no for ISIS no for us at freedom forever and the end we decided to come up to come out with another idea because ISIS like shut down all the, set, the TV, the satellites, they prevented all the internet coffee shops to work and then they let a couple of them to work after getting a license and those internet coffee shops were controlled by ISIS. So people they had no access to the, like, to the information, only ISIS media points or ISIS propaganda. So we started to distribute a magazine in the city. So our magazine has the same cover of ISIS magazine, Tabak. So for people who feel comfortable to pick it up 
and it's completely different material. And I like asked some people recently, what do you think about the magazine? People who wrote, like who read the magazine, and they said, oh, at some point, like it, they took them like eight. 80% of it to understand, it's not ISIS magazine. Some of them, they said, uh, ISIS turned to be secular. So it was like a good way just to spread. And like we focus on like on children. So this kind of cartoon written in like our lo local accent to have the children know that there are children. We have another section for their parents to tell them, okay, don't let your children be out. We're like a tribe community, so everyone should know the other in some point. So we were publishing stories of children who went and joined ISIS with names, with details, and what happened to them. And we thought when we were telling them, if you don't want to lose your children, don't let them out in the street. Be with them, educate them how in the home. Don't send don't send them like to ISIS schools. And then like sending messages for ISIS fighters or foreign fighters, like okay, saying to them, okay, you came like to defend Islam, but do you know that 95% of your victims are Muslims? Do you know that there are like people are starving there? Do you know that you're like just gaining power? So all this kind of messages, direct messages, we're just trying to remind them. Then like because of our activities, like our first colleague, al Matas Billah Ibrahim, was arrested in Raqqa and executed in a public square. So, and then like ISIS started tried to stop us in several ways. And here, like ISIS fight, one of ISIS fighters tweeting because they spread like cameras, security cameras all over the city. So trying to catch us, like saying, uh, that will be useful to catch the like of rockers being slaughtered silently, idiots. So, and like this, like screens and video cameras all over the cities, like checkpoints, all that thing. So, but like we decided that we'll not to stop because we noticed there like since us started to track us and trying to stop us that we're doing like a work or something that is affecting them. And later on, like one of our colleagues, they went to the street and they filmed the security camera and we tweeted, okay, here's your security cameras, what you're doing. Unfortunately, after that thing, they arrested the father of one of my colleagues and a couple of his friends and they were communicating with us either to give the name of our colleagues in Raqqa, or they will kill all of them. And it was like a hard decision to take, like my friend who was speaking in the video, and he said, like, I'm not gonna give any names. Then ISIS executed the father and the, th the four friends, and two official videos were, were made like in a professional way. And then like it was, it didn't stop at that point. And then they, we started the assassinations outside of uh, Syria, and it was in Turkey. So to their left, my, our colleague Ibrahim, he was like, 20 years old, and ISIS beheaded him in Orfa in Turkey. So they went to his house, they beheaded him with his friend who was with him, Faris Hamad, who's 18 years old. And then Ahmed Al Musa, the brother of my friend who lost his father, so he lost another brother in Idlib, which is not ISIS controlled area, so they assassinated him at midnight by uh, built. And they end, like Najah Jorf, who was like our trainer, our first movie maker. He helped us like to jump all these difficulties. They knew how important he is. They assassinated him in Gazi Intab in the afternoon, 12 p.m. in the city center. And he passed away and he left behind two kids. So then ISIS tried also by hacking us, so sending like several viruses. And at some point our website stopped more than the White House website. So ISIS tried like in several ways just to stop our website, sending like different viruses. And I like just shared a spoke about it yesterday. So I'm not gonna go deeply in it. And then we need like just to I need just to remind you that it's like not only ISIS extremism or terrorism. It might be like other like groups or other countries, other governments. If you will see like up to the left, like in March 2016, 131 civilians were wounded by the Russian airstrikes. You know, like 81 were killed by Russians. It was like at the same time, seven were killed or executed by ISIS. So that time, okay, like okay, it's not only ISIS. Here's the Russian as well. After that, we were able like, to make a change. Like, if you will go to Iraq right now, you will not have like ISIS propaganda, and it will not be easy to go and join ISIS anymore. So you will have Wikipedia, and then you will get to our website. So we were able to have this change, like to change the way of the source of information. Later on, or recently, Raqqa was, or like 
ISIS was defeated from the city, but the thing it was like by the international coalition supported and funded groups called YBJ or SDF. And uh, they like in the, in the media it was like a factory, ISIS was defeated, but uh, the first days like media didn't talk about like the other fact of the reality that 90% of the city is destroyed, thousands of people were killed, like those who were able to survive, they left behind neighbors, family members who were like under rubles, and they were like just celebrating. People, they didn't consider it as a liberation because even when they left the city, they were sent to an arresting camp and they couldn't, and they can't leave the arresting camps where there are like 450,000 local and they can't leave unless they have like a Kurdish person to grant, to grant them. So that the video showing like the destruction in the city and like under all these rubles, there are like thousands thousands of civilians who were killed. So the campaign was not planned at all. It was not organized. The main goal of it is like just to get rid of ISIS. And recently there was like an article on BBC saying like the dirty agreement or like a drug dirty agreement or deal. And this was talking that the international coalition knew about this agreement between YBJ or SCF to just get ISIS fighter to leave the city. I would agree with that things as far as like at the beginning that would avoid all this destruction, that will avoid like thousands of people being killed. But like at the end when ISIS was surrounded and they said, okay, so basically they let ISIS fighters leave the city. And then we turn to have like another extremism group or like government talking about US. So like during the uh, Raqqa campaign, which is from June and to October, more than a hand, a thousand eight, a thousand eight hundred seventy three civilians were killed were killed by, by the international coalition. It was like way more than the number of civilians who've been killed by ISIS. But okay, like ISIS for the media is like an interesting topic, but not as much as the coalition. So, and then like I came up with this idea that bombs will not defeat ISIS, but maybe the internet will. So as I said, it's more or less an ideology because we've seen ISIS everywhere. We've seen ISIS in Manchester with the attacks, in Berlin here, in Orlando, in Asia, in Africa, because this, ideology start to expand to be everywhere. And ISIS worked very well to expand this ideology. And recently with their videos, they were like announcing or promoting, don't come and join us. You can like, you can like make jihad wherever you are. If you have a car, go and kill like kuffars. If you have like a knife, go and kill them. So they started to call people to do attacks wherever. So it turned to be completely different way. So we need to focus on that things because the ideology could not be defeated with airstrikes. The idea, of could not be. And that's the fault of the international community. Okay, defeating armed group and like leaving whole generation of children, kids, people, living alone, like speaking about rock, other city, they were left alone, they were like destroyed. People, they don't have any places to go to it. So it's so important to highlight these issues and trying to figure out other ways. At the end, I will show you the trailer of City of God, the movie that, we were, that we've done recently. And I think like after there is like one slide, I will be done. I know that I spoke too much, I'm sorry. There's a threat to me against me. I'm against the social network. I'm against the network. I'm against the network. I'm against the network. I'm against the network. The men and women of Raqqa's being slaughtered silently are real journalistic heroes. They work in secret and under constant threat, reporting on the depredations of ISIS in their home city. Some have fled in fear for their own lives. Even in exile, they are in no way safe. اللي هو جهاز انترنت فضائي اللي ممكن داعش انه تلقط الاشارات تبعه عن طريق سيارات كان لازم نصلي الضوء على مدينة ووقتها طب الحقيقية بيننا وبين داعش بينشر صور عن الانترنت باسماءنا وصور مأخوذة من شوارع بيوتنا آه انا والد المدعو حمود محمد الموسى هن انه قدموا لنا واخونا مشان نوقف نحن راح نكمل اوعدك راح نكمل عم بسالوا اذا بشي يوم جديد بالرقه وصلوا 
بالنسبة لنا ما بأي مكان آمن بالعالم. It's not enough to expose the crimes of ISIS. We must also fight against their ideology. نتمنى أن نعيش بحياة أحسن من حياتنا اللي عشناها. وين على الدنيا بالحرب؟ Either we will win or they will kill all of us. So that was the trailer. I wanted to speak about like rising nationalism. Oh, I don't know what's that. And like a question that I get all the time. Who's like worse, ISIS or, or Assad? So I think like the photo can answer you. And the end, if you want to know more about us, that our details. Thank you very much. Thank you, Abdelaziz. And now we go to our second speaker, Aaron Zellin. All right, thank you. That was uh, amazing. It's a real honor to be on a panel with you, honestly. Um, so I'm going to be talking a little bit about the Islamic State's expansion strategy. Um, but first I wanted to show a, a brief video um, which I think touches upon a little bit with uh, Abdul Aziz was mentioning in terms of the global dimension and sort of how the Islamic State looks at what's going on and how they hope to really anywhere they can exploit issues to get a foothold. So that's a video from November 2014 after um, Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi announced that the group was extending itself as an organization or territory, however you want to describe it, outside of Iraq and Syria when they announced a variety of provinces elsewhere. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about how the group sort of goes from zero to 60 or how they essentially get from no territorial control over a certain area to full territorial control and what they do in that process. Of course, a lot of it has to do with the context and conditions and just because they try certain things doesn't necessarily mean they'll be successful. But based off of looking at thousands of primary source documents from the Islamic State, um, I was able to glean something and um, this is based off of one of the papers mentioned before the Islamic State's territorial methodology. So. What is this so-called, you know, caliphate project that the Islamic State has been attempting to do over the last few years? Um, for them, they want to establish an Islamic State based upon um, the prophetic methodology, um, based off of what their interpretation is of Islamic law. They also want to build a global network of members and supporters, primarily homegrown militants, but foreign fighters as well, and as we've seen in Iraq and Syria, but also in Libya, and even to a much lesser extent more recently in a place like Philippines that there have been a lot of foreigners that have joined up with this group. Um, but also they want to subvert and overtake Al-Qaeda um, in this broader global war for this mantle within this ideology that they believe in. Um, additionally, they want to spread these colonial projects via their sort of wilayat system or provinces. Um, and as uh, we saw in November 2014, they mentioned at that point that they were getting territory or claiming that they had territory in Algeria, in Libya, in the Sinai, in Yemen, Saudi, um, and then eventually they also announced stuff later on in Nigeria, um, Afghanistan, and the Caucasus. Of course, just because they announced something doesn't mean they actually control the territory. So just to sort of show that as an example, 
this is Iraq and Syria, um, as well as Libya. Um, these are the different provinces that they claim to control, or at least, you know, envision that they control. Um, of course, we know that they don't really control much territory anymore, but um, these posters that they put out online or trying to present to the broader public as well as to their supporters um, came out in around 2014. Um, but if you look at sort of the peak control of this organization in both lands, there's a huge difference. Um, so look at this and then look at that. As you can tell, especially with the case of Libya, it's pretty absurd. Um, but it does highlight the interest in what they're attempting to do. In terms of their project, while most people really only started paying attention to IS and what they've been up to since 2014 with the announcement of their um, so-called caliphate, um, they have had different stages in the being of this organization. Um, and we really saw them first attempting to have some level of governance in Iraq from 2006 to 2009. In many ways, it was more like a shadow government, government um, but it was mainly just moral policing. They didn't have the capacity to really do more than that. We saw this mature more as they went into Syria in 2013 and 14. Um, and they learned from some of the mistakes by reaching out to people more, and I'll get that into that, and sort of have this gradual process of takeover, as Abdul Aziz was mentioning, um, and having sort of a good face of the organization at first, but then, you know, turning the screws over time and implementing um, extremely harsh interpretations of Islamic law. And then finally, um, with the announcement of um, you know, the caliphate, uh, they sort of systematized and formalized a lot of these processes into this really robust bureaucracy. Um, uh, the poster uh, uh, here is from 2007, and it's a booklet that was put out online by uh, the Islamic State of Iraq, and talking about sort of the responsibilities of what the group should do. And I think, you know, we obviously have our own ideas of what a social contract is, and what is needed from a government and society, but this is sort of the responsibilities, at least from ISIS's perspective, they feel that they should have for the society that they're controlling. Prosecuting criminals and sinners, the implementation of the Hadood penalties or the fixed punishments in the Quran and Hadith, mediating and resolving conflicts between you know, various parties, whether it's uh, clans, tribes, whether it's issues over property and the like. Um, providing security, distributing food and relief, and selling oil and gas. So it's relatively limited, as you can see, compared to, say, what um, a Western democracy might do or, uh, you know, a country like China. Um, but what's interesting, if you look at sort of what they hope to achieve or what they believe this is their contract with the local population is, is that they didn't actually live up to this at all um, in the so-called 1.0 attempt or the 1.5 attempt. And you could say on some level that they did based off of their own interpretations in 2014, but once the military campaign really picked up against them, they really couldn't live up to their own expectations. Um, what's different about what IS is trying to do um, versus, say, Al-Qaeda historically um, is that they're recruiting people not just to become fighters, and this is why you did see a huge spike in foreign fighters coming to join up with the group after the announcement of the caliphate, because um, they're calling for people to be involved in this broader societal project. Um, and this was then further extended when Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi announced um, you know, these provinces outside of Iraq and Syria in November 2014. So based off of um, looking at thousands of documents and pictures and releases from IS, I was able to come up with sort of a pattern. Of course, um, it's not completely linear, but it helps provide a framework for really understanding um, what the Islamic State has attempted to do. And it's not only applicable in its core territories of Iraq and Syria when it was at its height, or even in the shrink territories around Abu Kamal and Al Qaim now, um, but also in these provinces that they've created outside. Um, so it's a good way of really assessing 
what state the group is in in terms of strength or lack of strength or recession of strength. Um, so there's two stages essentially. There's pre or partial territorial control um, and full territorial control. And within each stage there's five different phases which you can sort of explain. There's the intelligence, military, dawa or outreach, proselytization type of activities. There's the hizba or sort of moral policing and uh, consumer protection from their perspective. And then finally governance where there's more of this administration and economic activity. Of course it's important to note that part of this is based off of the information they're putting out. So just because they're putting it out as noted, it's not necessarily always the reality, but it highlights that when they get to a certain level of sophistication, they feel a certain level of comfort and power over a particular area. So I think it's important to note that. Um, so in terms of the first phase in the pre and partial territorial control, I wanted to give uh, examples from Libya to just highlight how this also is happening in other areas as well. Um, so essentially in this phase you have the establishment of sleeper cells, the infiltration of other groups, um, and the creation of front groups, buying off or co-opting local clans and other insurgent factions, and setting up training camps to prepare um, military campaigns to come. So one of the interesting things is that IS's chief um, Mufti, or became Turkey bin Ali uh, Bahraini, um, uh, who was killed earlier this year, if I recall. Um, he was in Libya in March to May 2013, right when IS extended itself territorially into Syria in April 2013. Um, and while it's never been confirmed, because he was traveling throughout North Africa and other parts of the Arab world at the time, um, it's believed that he was trying to build up support for the Islamic State in its fight with Al-Qaeda, but also in the lead up to the announcement of this caliphate. Moreover, you had individuals which are pointed to in the picture, Faiz Atiyah and Hassan al-Karami um, in Derna in June 2013. At the time, they're mainly associated with Ansar al-Shari in Libya, um, which was a pro-Al-Qaeda group. Um, and you could see that they're starting to develop these relationships that would be relevant for IS because one of the things that happened, especially in CERT, which is the area that they became most strong um, in Libya, was that they had a group of Ansar al Sharia guys defect to IS. Um, and then also you had Abu Abdullah al Libi, who was um, sort of the chief um, religious figure in Ansar al Sharia say that everybody should pledge bayah or uh, an oath of allegiance to Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. Um, so in many ways it's similar to what we saw in Iraq and Syria too where they would try and get defections, work off different relationships locally and then also they were able to feed off of resentment um, and displacement by some of the ex-Gaddafi loyalists in the same way we saw with the Ba'athists in the Iraqi case at, at least. Um, and this is just some examples of what I was just describing. Um, the top left is um, one of the front groups that IS created in Derna originally, Majul Shur Shabab al-Islam. You see a training camp um, in Benghazi. Then you see a poster on the lower left-hand corner for Turkey Bin Ali's lecture series in CERT when he was there. And then finally is the release about the pledging of Baya to IS by Abu Abdullah al-Libi. So in terms of the military aspects, um, I don't need to get into the military stuff too much just because I think it's pretty, um, you know, uh, well known what they've been doing. Um, but as was shown in, the, in Abdul Aziz's um, presentation was that a lot of these tactics were exemplified in their video clanging of the swords, which is what the um, uh, logo is at the bottom, um, which was, you know, they were doing all these drive-by shootings and other types of things where they would have people literally burying their own graves and then getting shot and put into them. Um, in terms of the Dao activities in the first phase, you primarily saw these Dao forums where they talk about their interpretations of Islam, the necessity of jihad, um, staging competitions with children. As noted, uh, children were very much an important aspect of their strategy to get broader support because for them they knew that this was the future and eventually their parents would die off or something along those lines. Um, so a lot of these activities were focused on kids, especially since they could be manipulated a lot easier than adults. Um, also you start to see um, the development of them passing out in the streets and markets at checkpoints, different uh, literature that they put out through their Alhima media. Um, 
about different religious issues. Um, you also had these public uh, video viewing parties for people to watch their official releases so that people would be indoctrinated into that. And also the opening up of public relations offices, which I alluded to a little bit earlier. Um, just to note, this is a picture of some uh, Christian Africans that converted to Islam. So this is part of the propaganda effort to show that they're bringing Islam to the broader society within Libya, but also that they're spreading it to other people as well. Um, and then this is just showing some pictures of what I was describing in terms of passing out some of the literature, people watching some of the videos, um, the, the thing in the middle that says al tahut um, which just means tyrant or idol in reference to what they perceive as apostate Arab regimes or their local rulers. This is one of the pamphlets that they would pass out. And then on the lower left-hand corner is one of these um, forums that they would put on. In, in the Hizba part of the first phase, you saw the establishment of Rijal Hizba or the men of Hizba. Um, and they would primarily be burning alcohol, cigarettes, hookah, drugs, what it deems to be sorcery-related activities. It's quite impressive how many magicians you will find in ISIS territory. It's as if there's like a Harry Potter convention or something, but somehow they find magicians. It's, it's totally bizarre. Um, but also they start destroying Sufi, Shia, pagan shrines, tombs, and historical artifacts. Of course, we've seen a number of this stuff in Tadmor, or Palmyra, in Syria as well. Um, part of this is because they view a lot of these things as polytheistic and therefore sort of contravening Tawheed or the unicity of God in their view. Um, they also would go around streets and markets to make sure people are praying on time, closing their shops. They would also monitor food and medicine to make sure it didn't expire. Um, so there's this consumer protection aspect of the Hizba as well. Um, and this is just again some examples, uh, photographic evidence. The top one is guys going to the market to examine the shops. Um, and the bottom one is them uh, destroying a Sufi shrine. In terms of the governance in the first phase, um, uh, you see more of an introduction of taxes, um, the exertion of its judicial powers, including arbitration and reconciliation between different parties. They're trying to show that they're bringing speedy justice through some level of um, payment or execution, um, as well as basic social services, especially for what they at least claim is to the most needy within society, though it's possible that it's probably their own supporters or members. Um, and this is just some pictures of them doing security as well as a market they're trying to show off. In terms of the intelligence uh, in phase two, once they get full territorial control, um, you see a more totalitarian apparatus, which was highlighted in the trailer um, of, the, of the City of Ghosts movie in terms of just tracking what people are up to. Um, and one of the things I wanted to highlight here, um, a case of Libya, but also we saw in the Deir Ezzor region with the Shaitat tribe um, and the Nimr tribe in Iraq, was that ISIS has learned something from the tribal awakening that happened last decade, is that you, know, you see in other countries where they do coup proofs against people trying to do a coup against them, Whereas what ISIS does, or at least we've seen them do, is sort of have this sahwa proofing or proofing against these sahwa type movements against them. Um, so as a result, they um, massacred uh, a group of people over a number of days in Sirt of the Firjan uh, clan. Um, and this is one of the mosques of the Firjan clan that was their main, you know, where many of the people went and they instead turned it into an ISIS mosque, and it's named after Abu Musab al-Zarqawi. Um, so, of course, for symbolic reasons, they did that. Um, additionally, in this phase, you see them trying to get repentances from their enemies um, so that they can then bring them into the fold, especially people that previously have been in the Gaddafi regime, um, so that they could then use them for the sort of knowledge that they had and a lot of the administrative skills. In the military of the second phase, um, we really only saw this in Iraq and Syria for a limited amount of time. We never really saw this in Libya, partially because there has not been any actual real state in Libya since the fall of Gaddafi, um, but also there isn't the same kind of heavy weaponry that's been inserted into the battlefield as there has been in Iraq and Syria as a consequence of you know, the US's Iraq war last decade, as well as all of the weapons campaigns um, that have gone into Syria over the last uh, six or seven years. 
In terms of uh, DAO activities in, in the second phase, you see a proliferation of Nuqtad al Ialamiya or media points. Um, there are these stationary stalls, small shacks, or roving cars, or Winnebago's that distribute printed literature, CDs, DVDs, USBs of ICE official media to locals with a target of uh, um, comprising primarily of children and young teenagers, again. Additionally, you saw them placing billboards in areas of their control to further their narrative and message. Um, the hope is that residents will see these messages and constantly, um, or they'll try and become self-reinforcing and second nature. And one of the ones that I always found interesting was a poster that said, here's the abode of Islam, here's the land of the caliphate, here are the ideas of al-wala al bara or loyalty to the Muslims and this of all the unbelievers stands. Um, here is the market of jihad, here are the winds of paradise, here is the glory, here is the dignity. And these are just some examples of the billboards um, as well as one of the media points. And then the lower left-hand corner is an exam for um, people that want to become preachers within their territory as they develop sort of their religious establishment with IS's um, control. In terms of Hizba, um, you start seeing the strict um, harsh judicial penalties as seen in some of the videos in Abdul Aziz's presentation. They're putting out the Tazir, Kisas, and Hadood penalties, including whippings, tying people to lampposts or fences, along with signs naming their misdeeds to try and deter future transgressions, caging individuals, cutting off hands or feet, stoning, point blank shootings, beheadings, and crucifixions. There's a lot of nasty stuff. Um, and just in some examples in Libya, you saw them crucifying an alleged spy, and I've got pictures on the next slide. I also put a warning, but it wasn't quite as graphic as yours, so I guess it won't seem quite as bad. Um, beheading a sorcerer, flogging a so-called fornicator and wine drinker, and then also destroying gravestones at small cemetery shrines. Um, they also, in this process, are trying to change the curriculum in classrooms and universities. Um, and in one case, they even abducted a barber in Bin Jawad, which is just um, to the east of Sirte, um because he was shaving people's beards, and for them, of course, they viewed that as un-Islamic. Um, so this is just a case, uh, you know, on the top, they're talking about this so-called spy from Fajr, Libya, um, one of the fighting groups there, and then destroying uh, these graves, flogging somebody, and then also in the top right hand about to chop somebody's head off. Um, and then finally, with um, uh, the full territorial control and governance, you see them really trying to establish themselves as this full frontal state. You see the black flags everywhere to try and show that they're the ones really in control. They're creating custom road signs, welcoming people to its city and towns, even changing their names, um, something that Ayman um, has highlighted a number of times in a number of areas of uh, Syria in particular. Um, but they also at least try and show that they're um, putting on these public work projects and restarting industries and territories they hold. Um, although um, it's important to note that just because they're showing it off doesn't say how competently they're doing it, how consistently they're doing it, or if it's just all some type of Hollywood production. Um, but it's important to note that they are doing this. So just to give some examples on the top left is the beautification projects that they're talking about in terms of landscaping and cleaning roads, putting up the flags, and then you have the Sharia court as well as their police station. <coughs> And then some other examples, they're, you know, um, in, uh, in their milk factory, they're also got this aluminum factory, woodwork, um, putting out fish in the markets. They also have this auto car shop and where you can buy cars as well, as, as well as showing that some of the stores <clears throat> um, were running as well in terms of kids' supplies for school, but also other things as well. Um, so. Returning to sort of the beginning and the control of territory they have, this is the most recent and up-to-date look at how much territory IS controls, and I'm talking specifically about the gray area and the territory between Iraq and Syria because that's primarily where they are um, today now. Um, so if you look at this framework then, they really are only able to be in the first phase now and really only doing intelligence and military type of activities, not much more than that. You have seen, you know, one example, but it's an anomaly in some ways because it's the first time that they put anything out related to Hizbah in 
more than a month the other day in um, uh, the Armouk refugee camp where they're burning cigarettes as part of their Hezbollah campaign, but otherwise it's pretty much weakened to the point where they're only in the earliest um, stage and earliest phases there. Um, but I think it's important to understand sort of how they're attempting to do this because it's a guide for the development or aggression of IS in other areas, whether it's in Iraq and Syria again if they come back for a second time, whether it's possibly in Libya again, or whether it's in a place like the Philippines, which you know for many people seem like it came out of nowhere in Marawi, um, but even elsewhere where we're not even thinking about now or could happen in the future, somewhere like Somalia or you know somewhere else in Africa or who knows, maybe in Europe one day, just because of a lot of the polarization that's happening within societies. So, not to be cynical, but it is a possibility in, in, in like 15 or 20 years. Um, so I'll just leave it at there. Um, and if you have any questions or comments or just curious more about my writings and what I'm up to, feel free to follow that. So thank you. Thank you, Aaron. I think I'll, I'll just start with a very broad question um, because um, you're both running online platforms that seem pretty integral to the work that you're doing. And, and one of the things that I wanted to kind of hear more about is, um, Abdelaziz, you talk about this idea of trying to um, uh, defeat this ideological time bomb um, and, and the ways in which maybe the platform is trying to address that. Um, so I, I guess I'd like you both maybe to elaborate on what the goals of, of these platforms could be and how they can kind of tra transgress beyond just putting information out there. Like how might they play a role in, in transforming that ideological issue? Um, and who are you speaking to? So, yeah, so the, like we were like, like, yeah, the online platform were like so important because ISIS, what they did first, they prevented all media organization to go there to their territories and cover what's going on. So they had their own media just to show whatever things they want. So if there's, and they don't do live stuff. So they don't have like live cameras and they don't walk in the street. So they film everything, they edit it, and then they publish it. So if anyone says something that they disagree with, they will not show it. So, and they will not show like the suffering of people or like many other things that might affect them. So that was so important to have like other groups or platforms to speak about that things or like to analyze many things. ISIS is, had done like thousands of mistakes that we could able to, like to analyze or to see with the videos or with the photos or like the way of their speeches, how like sometimes they say something and in a different speech they say like the opposite, how they change like the style of the speech, the way of the speech. So it was so important like to track all that things to show all that stuff because people they were like stuck only with us as a propaganda and whenever you have like one source of information in some point you will turn to believe in it and in some point like early in the beginning like all the media started to take ISIS as a source so they started to re-propaganda ISIS again and again so uh, the main thing was like just to have like independent source of information to let people know what's going on so for us, like we decided to target everyone. So that's the reason when ISIS shut down everything, we started the activities in Raqqa. So most of the people had no access to the internet, but they could have access to the magazine, to the posters, all that stuff. And speaking about like the international community or like international countries or whatever, we've been to schools, we've been to universities, we've been like to several communities to speak with people. And like I noticed that thing, speaking as an example, with Muslim communities. So they were telling me uh, we used to have like real, like people from like government and like many communities they they had this perspective that they should do the opposite anyone like anyone from the government telling them to do so if you will have like someone from the German Foreign Office telling Muslim communities uh, don't join ISIS they would they will go and join ISIS because he told them like not to join ISIS 
You know, so it's like an issue and like sending someone who's never been to Syria, who can't speak Arabic, who read like three books about Syria and suddenly started like to advise people and like when they ask him about something from Quran, like they don't have, they don't know how to agree. If they ask them like about basic information, they don't know about it. So they are like surrounded in this circle. So it was so important because like all of us, we're local, we're from Raqqa, we're like I'm Muslim. So we can like speak with each other. So I can like, like tell them, okay, I'm from Raqqa. That my photo, I was playing soccer, was like hanging out. And then I turned here, like speaking with people and doing all that thing. So it was also so important to highlight that things, being with like, different communities and speaking up to a local respective from someone who's been living there and like who, like who witnessed all this group. So all that things together was so important. And yeah, so the media played a main role. So, and like as we like watch in the video the, from the city of Ghost, like ISIS like spent all that money, all these things. So for ISIS focus more on the media, so it was so important to fight them with the same weapon that they're using. So just to follow up on that point, I was curious, I mean, how big is this network now? Um, and since you're talking about um, opposing this very sav media savvy and very well funded um, propaganda machine, how, how is your organization being sustained? Yeah, so, so far we're like a small team. We're almost 27 between like Syria and outside Syria. And we're like kind of voluntary, so we don't have fun. So even with all that things, we were like operating by ourselves. So for sure, like we don't have the same fund as ISIS if they will give, if they will give us like $155,000 per month, like we could produce even comedy movies. So, but like unfortunately nothing. And like we had like just to do all that things with like bad quality equipment, like with like bad Samsung, mobile phones so because like like uh, in Raqqa people they don't have iPhone 8 so far so like just dealing with all the things with like all the equipment with all the things that we were able to do and like the main thing that none of us studied any media or any journalism or anything linked to what we were doing and none of us came from like a political background or like a family, like a political family. So all of us we supposed to be like like scientists, doctors, teacher, everything, but not like journalists or like people who are speaking about extremism. So yeah, like experience was like the main important thing. So, but yeah, even though we were able to make a change even with almost nothing. Thank you. And Aaron, um, your research, your, your uh, uh, PhD researchers focus on jihadi movements in Tunisia, and you just talked to us a lot about Libya, which seems to be a black void in the media. Um, but you run a, a podcast called Jihad Pod and Jihad and a, and a website called Jihadology.net, and I was curious if you can speak more to um, what are you attempting to do with those platforms, and again, who, who are you speaking to? Sure, so um, my website, Jihadology, uh, started in May 2010 when I completed my master's because um, when I was doing my master's thesis there wasn't like a class in school telling you how to access primary source documents from mostly Al-Qaeda at the time and the various affiliated ideologues um, and through the process of doing my master's thesis I kind of just taught myself where to find the content um, and so I figured that you know if I was having trouble with this I'm sure other graduate students were as well um, and that's really the main impetus for why I started the website in the first place. I never thought it would get as big as it did um, or people would know me for that. Um, and then over time I've added some other features besides just primary sources such as analysis um, as well as some other like articles of the week thing um, to try and curate it, um, you know, in terms of so people better understand it. I mean, for me, um, when I started looking at a lot of these documents, it's a lot different than what you usually hear in the day-to-day -day in the media. Things are a lot more sophisticated and complicated in the way that these groups and individuals argue about these issues. And it's not just all about killing people either. I mean, there's this whole cultural aspect of it as well. Um, and also, you know, they're attempting to have these, you know, governance types of projects that I alluded to and showed in the presentation. Um, so I think a lot of it for me was primarily about just education and better access for academics to better understand. And I do think because of that, 
there has been a better quality and analysis over time within the academic community. But I do still think that there is some gap, at least within the Western world, um, and that there's an over, uh, you know, uh, there's too much focus on the content in English or French or German. Obviously, I understand why, because it's a more immediate threat, but the reality is, is that most of what's going on is happening in the Arab world, so, and 90% of what's posted is in Arabic, so if we're not understanding what's happening in the core territories where this is going on and where this movement originally started, we're just, um, you know, walking around blind, so I think there are still gaps and there are some improvements, but hopefully it provides a platform which, you know, can provide other um, researchers, analysts, academics, whomever, a better way of understanding and appreciating what's going on, not just in Iraq and Syria, but, you know, Libya, Nigeria, Somalia, Philippines, Afghanistan, wherever, because, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is that, you know, Ayman and I were actually talking about earlier today is in the run-up to IS taking over territory in Syria is that for people like us who are following the content in Arabic and what they're doing on a daily basis, we saw it coming. It was almost like it was choreographed. Um, but for everybody else, um, it seemed like it just came out of nowhere where it really did not. So. so I'd like to open up the floor for questions. One in the front. And if you can please say your, your name for your question. Hey, I'm Gabriel. That's my name. <laughs> and I have a question to you, uh, Abdelaziz. Um, well, first of all, thank you very much for this lovely presentation. Um, I assume, I wanted to ask you about the trailer for the film that we saw, uh, City of Ghosts. I can only assume that you don't necessarily approach this film as a work of art, but obviously you have a cause. But I wanted to ask you about the visual language of the trailer. Um, is it on purpose, or did you take into account the aesthetics, or were they meant in a way to resemble the type of aesthetics that ISIS themselves use in their propaganda, or was it something completely different? Did you use it subversively, or is it just a different production company who made this trailer and they used that particular After Effects kind of styling? Yeah, it's like mostly if you've seen, like in the trailer, there is like a bar where I was in a conference holding a microphone. So it was almost collected from conferences that we, like things that we said, even like the name of movie, City of Ghosts. I was once talking about Raqqa and I said, it looks like City of Ghosts. So all that things were collected from conference that we attended, like from lectures or presentations, like as this one. And yeah, so, and yeah, for sure, like we're not the editors and we're not the protection company, but yeah, for sure, like they, it's like an American one, but they knew like how to make that things, you know, Americans are like uh, so professional doing that stuff. But yeah, all that stuff that was said or like presented in the documentary or like in the trailer, it was like collected from conferences or things that we were saying, because the movie crew was following us for almost 11 months and like following all the activity, almost all the activities that we were doing. And then yeah, in some way they picked like a couple of sentences that we said and they made it in this, in such way. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Alex, um, a research manager covering Syria. Um, my question is for you, Abdelaziz, um, about uh, you know, you've talked a lot about the role of civil society in Raqqa in your presentation, you know, not just uh, now, but after the fall of the regime in the city and how that was a time when, when uh, civil society flourished. Um, now that we've seen ISIS physically uh, pushed out of Raqqa, um, not that many people have moved back into the city because of the destruction, um, but I think a lot of us have seen the very vivid imagery of what some Raqqawis I've spoken to say uh, are the new occupiers, uh, the, the SDF coming in, uh, some would say liberators as well. Um, can I just ask for RBSS uh, as a group that has documented um, the conditions in Raqqa, 
Do you plan to continue documenting the conditions in Raqqa under um, its new governors? Uh, and how do you plan to do that in addition to the work that you've said that you plan to continue doing on countering ISIS ideology? Yes, so like as I spoke, like civil society organization played main role when Assad forces were defeated. But with the new group SDF or technically YBJ, they prevented most of the civil society organization to work. So if there is any civil society organization that want to do anything in Raqqa, they should be registered first with SDF. And they let only organizations that cleaning streets, painting walls to work. And that like a big question mark. Speaking about Al Abyad, which was controlled by the same group in 2015, we haven't seen any civil society organization working. Even when Al Nusra was in 2013, we had more than 40 civil society organizations. So it's like a huge question mark. And like the Americans, they're trying just to step away from these questions. And like the main focus for like the international community is just defeating ISIS as arms. So it's not necessary for them, like if there is anything will happen to the city or like the rebuilding or whatever. So them, their main goal just to get rid of those of ISIS to prevent like more terror attacks happening in Europe or in US. So the thing they try just to avoid the civil society organization to take part. For us as as RBSS, we we like we. We started like early in the beginning to document uh, SDF or YBJ uh, atrocities. It's not only YBJ, it's like the Turkish guard borders. If you see like at the photo in my presentation, the Turkish is like uh, guard borders, the Russian, the American, the Kaolijan, the Syrian regime, all the groups. And like for me, like in 2015, I tried to go to, to Tel Abyad. I was prevented to go there and like uh, YBJ accused me to be ISIS supporter. So for us, like, uh, for us, like we, we're still like working even undercover because we can show our identity because whenever we show the identity of any of our colleagues, they will be arrested immediately. So the thing we will do it either ways. If we will do it in public, we'll do it in public. Otherwise, we've been dealing with ISIS for like a couple of years. So it would be like easier with YBJ, you know? So, and then, but like we're trying to push to have this environment to be able to work because there are like many things we can do it. Speaking about like children, education, awareness about women, the, like the rebuilding of the city, and like having people involved of like going back and rebuild the city, trying to find local people to run the city, like to have almost the same experience of 2013 and make it better. Because yeah, like the city was like developing in some point and the problem was the gap in power, like uh, this vacuum in power that ISIS filled in. Hey, I'm Magnus, and thanks for a wonderful presentation, both of you. And it's, I've been fortunate enough to know you for a few years now at Delaziz, and it's always so inspiring to hear you speak. From an international donor perspective, international organizations, and maybe also international tech companies like Twitter, Facebook, your main platforms, how is that relationship between that community and Raqqa is being slaughtered silently evolved over time, like when were you first approached by any international organizations or funders? What, were, what did they do wrong? What did they do right in supporting your amazing work? Could you talk us through that process? Yeah, like speaking about funders in 2000, like we started in April 2014 and we got fund for one year from January 2015 to January 2016. And it was by American NGO. But the thing since like the Kaolijans started to be involved in the situation and we decided that we should speak about, about the atrocities of the Kaolijans as all the groups, I'm not like sure, they, they, for sure they didn't say that thing. But that organization stopped working in Syria anymore. And then like the, like the thing in 2004, 15, like many organizations, they were fighting, oh, we want to fund you, we want to fund you. So, and then when we, like I noticed that like most or like the majority of 
the funders, they have agendas. And if you will not follow their agenda, they will not be interested in funding you. Speaking about the Silicon Valley or Facebook, Twitter, we have like many problems with them. So they, like, they closed uh, RBSS Facebook page like two or three times, Facebook. And then we were like at, like at the end, like I got in touch with them and I told them, I swear we're not ISIS supporter or not ISIS fighters. And through our friends we were able, and through CBJ, Committee to Protect Journalists, we were able to provide our Facebook page. My like, personal account was closed many times on Twitter and Facebook. <coughs> and then like, we were able like, to reach them out and telling them, okay, we don't need anything from you. Don't like, promote our boss or our tweets, but don't close it. So we got like, to that point and like, we were lucky to be verified also on Twitter and through CBG as well. So all that things was like, important, but like, we didn't like, collaborate in high level because uh, Google came out with this new technology or this tool to filter the searching of ISIS or whatever, and they used like our material. So they didn't ask us, but that was so cute, so nice to use our material. So, but at the same time, they should do many things because like, like, like social networks or platforms are like the main platform that ISIS are using, and they need to develop their works. Like speaking about Twitter, there were like many accounts for like, for like extremists, it took them like 40 days to close it, even there were like many reports because they didn't have like enough team of Arabic speaker. So that was like one of the problems. So they think, okay, they need to focus in English. But speaking about these groups, as he said, like most of the things are coming up with Arabic. And then, yeah, when ISIS like used like many technology, they, as like Charlie spoke yesterday, they turned to use Telegram and then, okay, they, they don't give up making like new accounts and then using like the trending hashtag to spread their ideas. So if there is anything about like Britney Spears or like Kim Kardashian, you find them going to this hashtag like promoting their stuff. So the second value in some point, and it's sometimes it's so easy to track them. So they're using like a hashtag and like it's so hard for Twitter like, you know, just to think about it in some point. But like, yeah, they developed recently. I actually have a question for both of you, so I know we are also a bit out of time, but okay, now I execute a bit my <laughs> power over the organizer. Um, so one is for Aaron, and I wanted to ask you, since, uh, since the beginning we are always saying that in this conference we were really careful about uh, which material to show, which language to use, which term actually to present, uh, um, because of course there is always a risk of doing counter-propaganda. I wanted to ask you with your platform, uh, uh, Geodology, if you also reflected about that, because of course you had inside a lot of source video uh, uh, from also the ISIS propaganda that has been really useful for a lot of media and journalists, but of course aggregating all together is also a way indirectly to promote it. So I also want to ask you what you think about that. And then uh, to Abdelaziz, actually I don't know if you can answer, but you decide what you can say, because I'm curious also how your group was working in terms of networking, because especially if in Raqqa all the net was shut down, how did you manage to get the material from the people? I mean, uh, did you add a broader network with different nodes? I don't know if you can tell these things, but I think it would be interesting to understand also in a moment of total shutdown and censorship, how can you actually still run a platform that is uh, exposing uh, facts? Yeah, it's a very good question. It's uh, something I've thought about since I first started um, the website back in May 2010. Um, uh, you know, for me, uh, you know, there were people that were getting involved in these issues before I started my website. And if I closed it down tomorrow, there would still be people interested in it as well. Um, and I think for public knowledge's sake, it's better that we actually know what's going on instead of sticking our heads in the sand. Um, in addition to that, I actually think most, you know, I'm, I'm sure some people use it that are jihadists, but I think a lot of them mainly go to the direct telegram channels um, from IS or another group just because I think they probably trust them more than they trust me. 
Um, so I don't necessarily have as much of an issue. Plus, 90% of the content, as I said, on my website is in Arabic, but most of the traffic on my website are from Western countries. So there's an imbalance there, so I suspect a lot of the traffic is probably also from people in governments. Um, so, you know, it's obviously a very tricky issue, but luckily I do live in the U.S. and I do have the First Amendment. I'm pretty sure if I had my website in some countries in Europe, it would probably be shut down, um, whether like a place like the U.K. or France where they've been increasingly suppressing free speech. Um, so it's, it's definitely a dilemma, but I, I think that there's more utility overall than the, har the p potential harm. Yeah, so like I would try like to ask to answer part of it because I know many people are like curious how we're like smuggling all that stuff, especially when ISIS shut down all the things. So the good thing that we're like all local and we're from the city, we know it very well. And as I said, Rock is a tribe community, so everyone should know the other at some point. So and our friends they have like relatives or with ISIS, they have like friends, whatever. And sometimes having like basic conversation, you were able like to get many information and the news. And that's how we were able like just to come out with many news and things before it was published by ISIS or any other groups. So by having this like basic or normal conversation like our colleagues had with other people. So we knew about this new rules about shutting down all the internet and everything before ISIS established it. So we were able to figure out a couple of ways how to communicate. And in some point, since ISIS is defeated from the city, we were able to hack ISIS in some point. Like I don't mean hack it like, like through technology, but through some people. So we were able like just to collaborate with some people. So I don't want to speak a lot about it. I don't want to be arrested. So that was like also helpful for us. And then we figure out like several ways how to smuggle information out. Great, I'd like to thank our two speakers, if you can join me in thanking them. And thank you for sticking around till the end of the evening. Tatiana has one last message before you leave. Yes, so I wanted to thank you a lot and also ask the public please to stay other five minutes because we have a little of a surprise. But first I want to really thank for the great panel, most of all for the work you did because, uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, is highly important. But I don't want to keep you here on stage during the surprise because it's <laughs> annoying. So thank you very much and please stay other five minutes and another applause to them. So now uh, we are going uh, to close actually our program, but also our year of work. Um, in a sense, it's not completely closed because tomorrow we have a workshop, so I remind you. Uh, we have the workshop from 2 to 5 at Supermarkt that is called Facing Terrorist Threat, Cybersecurity and Digital Self-Defense with Disha Otman and I'm an Altamimi. So please come and, and if you still didn't register, you can do at the entrance. And then uh, I would like to close our year first, uh, inviting here on stage with me Mauro Mondello, that has been the curator of the conference together with me. <laughs> and then I would like, uh, thank you Mauro. <laughs> And then I would like to invite uh, on stage uh, the two project managers that really worked hard to make this conference happen, Nada Bakker and Kim Foss. Please come here. <laughs> and uh, I also would like uh, how is going on there, yeah? <laughs> uh, there is an operation uh, going on, but uh, we will wait a second. <laughs> I also would like to uh, call on stage uh, Claudia Dorfmuller, that is also project manager of the Disruption Network Club, that have been working a lot with us for the whole half of the year to also lead to this conference, and at the same time, 
uh, for the previous conference that we had, the prisoner of this end. So you, you all get flowers. <laughs> And then he's not finished here because he has never been called on stage, but now since there is Mauro, I think you can do a really nice picture. So Jonas Franke, please come. <laughs> that is our visual designer that has always done all the gray flyer, animation, so is him. Thank you very much, Jonas. And uh, I cannot call on stage everybody, otherwise we don't have anybody filming, taking photos, or <laughs> working with the sound, but I want to thank them. Elisabeth Enk uh, for the technology support and the sound sitting over there. And uh, Gonzalo and Angel and all the Rosso film crew for the great video, and Gabriel for the great video work that they do since three years with us. Maria Silfano that is actually taking photo and is sitting over there, so she cannot come on stage. Also, I want to thank for this uh, special conference, the old security apparatus, because they have been working a lot and I can understand this pretty annoying and difficult job, so thank you all as well. And um, um, the great uh, cash desk uh, support, uh, Rosita and Katia, and also all the people that help us to make this conference possible, and of course all the participants and the public that has been with us. And so we want to say also that we have a great special program that uh, is supposed to happen next year, but we still at the moment don't know if we have funds. Actually, now our fundraising starts for next year. So, you know, this is a, has been a bit a difficult year, but uh, we are also really proud that we made this conference possible and also the previous one, Prisoners of Descent. So, in a sense, we are working hard to also deliver this kind of subjects. Uh, and uh, since, you know, I'm concluding like that, remember to give us donation. <laughs> and we have a great uh, disrupticorn at the entrance. And thanks a lot, everybody, for being with us. <laughs>